All right, we're here. Twitch.tv slash 110sports, 110sportsmedia.com slash live. Thank you so much for joining us on a Monday. It's a snowy Monday here in Germantown, Tennessee. I'm pretty sure it's a snowy Monday morning in Michigan and a snowy Monday morning in St. Louis. But nonetheless, we're all here. Despite exploding pipes and cold temperatures, we're here. Josh Dorian, Chris Brown in the correct overlays. Uh, gentlemen, how you doing on this Monday morning? surviving yeah yeah we got a winter storm you know coming down across the country but it's you know can't complain too much i guess because we didn't really have winter up until this point we didn't have the big snowstorm but uh yeah yeah we're surviving not only that but at least around here there were times that i wasn't convinced it was winter like it oh, just yeah. like oh, it's 40 degrees like in even Right around here, cold here is rel- relative to cold where you you guys live is completely different. Mm-hmm. Um, but there were just like we would go weeks without dipping into the 30s, and now yeah. it's negative two. It feels like negative two here, and anybody who's from the south knows that that's <laughs> that is a, an outlier for sure. And and now it's like actually snowing. There's like real snow here, and that's even more of an outlier. Um, because every time it's supposed to snow, it just doesn't. This time it actually has. But um, thankfully, 110 Daily does not require us to sit outside. So we don't have to be We don't have to be in the snow. Thank you so much for joining us on a Monday. We got a lot to get to. It's a busy weekend uh, from many perspectives. And we can also have some conversations about, um, you know, there's quite a bit of there's quite a bit up in the air about the NFL season in terms of where some impact players are going to be specifically right on, on Friday. It was JJ Watt announcing that he's been released, uh, that he and the the Texans agreeing to part ways mutually, um, right. Deshaun Watson being a Texan while they say they want to, they have no intention of trading him, keeping a quarterback that doesn't want to be there whatsoever. doesn't sound like the best move for business. And then you have Carson Wentz and Philly, which is also just a kind of an awkward situation for everybody. So in the second hour, we'll get to landing spots, destinations for Carson Wentz and J.J. Watt. Winners and losers at the end of the show, but we're going to start with the weekend in college basketball. Run through some takeaways, some observations from the last couple of days in college hoops. And, uh, and we'll get rolling from there. Mr. Doring, we'll start with you. Um, what, what, uh, what do you fancy about the college basketball weekend? What catches your eyes? What are, what's on your mind after the, the weekend of college hoops? One thing on my mind more than anything else is that the Missouri Valley Conference is a two-bid league. I, mean, I, don't this, yeah. I don't want to have this discussion anymore. I mean, you have to put the caveat of as long as things go the way they're supposed to go. Yes. Two bid league, meaning there are two NCAA tournament quality teams in this conference. I don't need to see anything more to believe whether they make it or not is a different story, Mm -hmm. but coming out of this weekend, you got exactly what you wanted in terms of getting both of these teams in a position where they control their destiny when it comes to the NCAA tournament. Loyola obliterates Drake in the second half of game one. And looks like an absolute juggernaut. Cameron Clutrig is doing his thing. He's college basketball's version of Nikola Jokic. His skill set is just incredible and so much fun to watch and so different than most bigs you see in Mm -hmm. basketball today. And then Drake, to their credit, without Tank Kempo, your leading scorer, your one, arguably your best player probably second best but a key to this team you come into this weekend just having lost him for an extended period of time Mm -hmm. and they find a way to win this incredibly ugly game that both teams needed overtime to score 50 points (laughs) but they they found a way yep and so they split this series roman penn had a bad weekend which is something you just can't afford when hempill is out but in that second game, he came up massive at the end and had his best stretch when it mattered most. You saw why he's right there with Crutwig in terms of Valley Player of the Year 
competition or you know mm-hmm. the, the battle for player of the year I, this is exactly what we wanted at least what i wanted and i you know you've talked about this josh of wanting to come out of this feeling like these two teams are both very very good mm-hmm. and that's exactly what i felt like even though drake got blown on the second half of game one they came in at a disadvantage still found a way to get a win and won two of the four halves they were winning at halftime in game one and then gave up 50 points in the second half I was very impressed by both these teams. I have a lot of respect for both of them, and I am thrilled that they're both on track to make the NCAA tournament now. So this was my winner. So I might as well just talk about them now and sort of piggyback off of what what you just said, right? I mean, everybody in the college basketball world wanted this to be a competitive weekend between these two teams, but nobody wanted this, right? Nobody needed this to be a split more than the Missouri Valley Conference. And the Missouri Valley Conference was my winner from the weekend. Um, it doesn't make any sense for me to hold that until the end of the until the end of the show and we have the exact same conversation, so I'll just bring it up now. But these two teams splitting the weekend series, like you said, Justin, as long as things go the way they're supposed to the rest of the way and neither team falls apart until, you know, presumably they meet again in the MVC national national championship and the MVC championship game that this is a two bid conference, right? As long as they take care of business the rest of the way. And then no matter what happens in that hypothetical MVC championship game, right? One team will get the auto bid, but the other team is in a position to make the tournament regardless of what happens as long as right. Things go the way that they're supposed to exactly right. That it's, these are two really quality basketball teams and they helped each other out this weekend by going one and one and splitting this series. And, you know, the win that Loyola Chicago got, you know, helps with the net because they, they, they won by so many points and, but then Drake comes back and gets a win against them. Um, It's a nice combination of, because the Loyola Chicago is not just loved because of their record. They're loved by the, by all of the metrics. Oh, I yeah. mean, we're talking about a top 15, 20 Ken Palm team in Loyola Chicago. Right now they're 10th in the net and number one in adjusted defensive efficiency. And then you have this Drake team who can sort of piggyback off that and them getting a win really helps solidify their resume based on, because that's a quad one win, right? It's quad one win. Oh, yeah. And mm-hmm. that, and so from a, not just a, we have two quality basketball teams here. One of those teams helped themselves by getting a blowout win like that. And the other team got a win against a quad one team. And, and I, Drake might be a quad one team still. I'm not positive about that. I haven't checked the net ranking since they dropped like 20 spots after losing uh, last week. But the point is still the same, that it was a great weekend for the MVC because of what happened on the floor, but also what has been happening in the metrics in the net and, um, what getting a win what the wins that each team got uh means for for them so i'm right there with you chris your first takeaway uh yes uh, and also i'll say before i share my first takeaway i just noticed here Louis chicago is first at ken palm in defensive efficiency which is, that just really got my attention uh and they're 10th overall um my first takeaway from the weekend is Oh, I lost my I lost my notes. Here we go. Okay, here we go. Yes, I know what we're talking about. All right, Michigan. I think that they've very quickly reinforced that they are still the Big Ten's best team right out of the right out of the gate. Right. This was my game that I was really interested in watching this weekend. There would have been so many understandable excuses if they had lost to Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. This game was in Madison. The Wolverines hadn't played in over three weeks because Michigan was shut down. Um, and they trailed by 14 points at one point in the first half on the road against a ranked team. And then they went on a 40 to 20 run that for, outscored Michigan, outscored Wisconsin 40 to 20 in the second half. Impressive 67 59 win. A sensational defensive performance in the second half. They held Wisconsin to 0. 0.6 points per possession yep. in the second half. Shot just 25%, one of 13 from beyond the arc. There were obviously some other things happening for Wisconsin in this game, some very just like not acceptable performances from some of their bigs in this game. Grabbing um, zero rebounds, both of them. Right. Yeah. Like that's just not going to work. Uh, and anyway, and you can't not like 
that's just such a fluky thing that you're never going to expect that again and it's also just not like that that doesn't work but um but you know i was really impressed by what i saw from they have hunter hunter dickinson um really impressive 11 rebound 11 points 15 rebounds five blocks he makes this michigan team different he demands so much attention from opposing defenses they may try to double team him but of course they've got those three-point shooters that can make you pay so it makes them different makes them harder to defend um we've already seen that this michigan team can win in several ways, depending on uh, or relying on different players. But now we also saw this sort of this veteran poise, this uh, Juwan Howard's ability to keep this team calm and cool and collected under pressure when they're down in situations where it would be easy for them to just not, you know, to just sort of not throw in the towel, but sort of just that, you know, they're down by 14 on the road. That could have just been it. And nobody would have really thought that much less of them had they lost by eight in Madison. But this resilience that we're seeing from them, this, you know, there's just so few things about them that are really concerning to me at this point. I'm not saying there aren't any flaws, there aren't any potential holes in their game, but I just continue to be so impressed by them. I really was interested to see and seeing what they looked like. And this was the, the best case scenario. I'm really convinced that this team is is in that second tier. I mean, obviously they're ranked third in the country right now. I'm not saying that they are as good as Baylor or as good as, you know, but I think they're very clearly right there. And it makes all the sense in the world that they continue to be considered a team that is right there in tier one C or, or whatever you want to call it, or tier three or tier two, whatever it is. Um, really impressed by Michigan, obviously Ohio state, you know, crushed IU. And so they're right there, you know, it's going to be interesting, but uh, really impressed by Michigan. This was also my first takeaway is that and it's slightly different scope but essentially getting at the same thing is that michigan really is serious about winning the big 10 because i f really right coming off of basically a month of not playing games and then you have to go at wisconsin and your first game back is daunting yeah and then after this three of their next four games are rutgers ohio state and iowa and illinois and ohio state are still only half a game back why they needed to hit the ground running when it would when it's almost unrealistic to expect them to hit the ground running against teams mm -hmm. that are also really high quality and teams that haven't had to take three weeks off essentially right um as a fair or not they needed to win this game because they need a little and it half a game isn't really breathing room but when you only have a half game lead over Illinois and Ohio State and you have another head to head with Ohio State in the future, this is the kind of game that you probably right, Wisconsin has some of these losses against these other teams, so you can't fall behind like that. And the reality of the situation is is that they probably aren't gonna get to make up all of those games. So it's just not they're a little bit behind the eight ball in that sense, but at the same time, you got to come back. You got to win games immediately, um, especially with Rutgers, Ohio State, and Iowa all on the horizon. They continue to win games at a clip that nobody is winning games in the Big Ten. Right? They haven't played as many games, but they're still they're nine and one now, and that's just not something I was expecting to see from a Big Ten team this year, and especially not expecting to see from Michigan this year. Um, yeah, they're legit. They deserve all of the praise that comes with that three and one, that number three ranking in the AP poll, and uh, continue to be impressive and, and sort of uh, clear hurdles that are that are in their way. I'll piggyback off of both of you for my second one, which is we know who the best four teams in the country are. It's the four teams we just mentioned, or the the two obvious ones. Gonzaga mm -hmm. is in the the one seeds right now. Mm -hmm. Gonzaga, Baylor, Michigan, Ohio State. Illinois needed overtime to beat Nebraska. Villanova, Villanova got destroyed by Creighton. We're running out of teams that are in serious contention to make it a conversation with Michigan and Ohio State, in particular Michigan. Because mm -hmm. Ohio right. State had a, had a rough stretch at the beginning, but the way that they're playing now, I mean, I I want the I'll, – I'll forgive some losses early, and also because they haven't been shut down, they've played more games. Right. I'll, I – I've got somebody, and I've been disappointed with Illinois at times. Mm -hmm. I 
am somewhat skeptical that Illinois is really a top five team in the country. I, so somebody's going to have to do something for me to change my mind on this, but I very much came away from this week. I'm feeling like we know not only are these going to be the one seeds because of their resumes, barring something unforeseen, but that these are absolutely the four best teams in the country divided into two tiers. How many coaches are you picking before you pick Chris Holtman? Because it's not because because he, he keeps doing less things with teams, he keeps doing things with teams that you're not yep. expecting him to do, right? Less, less than ten, right? Yeah. Um, I was gonna say somewhere between five and ten, yeah. And it right, it's and it's different from right because you'll probably still pick Mark Few, you'll probably oh, yeah. like, but he's the only one, right? Jawan Howard, but also Jawan Howard hasn't been doing it long enough to pick. Chris Holtman above. Yeah, I'll, I'll take Holtman over Howard. Mm-hmm. But so my point is, is that right? Everybody else in the top ten of the AP, of the current AP poll is, except for maybe Michigan, is supposed to be there at least to a certain extent. Gonzaga, Baylor, Villanova, Illinois, Texas Tech, Houston, Virginia, Missouri, maybe not. But the point is, is that Ohio State is reaching a place that nobody thought they were going to reach along with, with Michigan. And since Holtman got to Ohio state, I mean, has there been a year where Holtman hasn't exceeded the expectations that we put on Ohio state before the year started? No. I mean, that goes back to Butler and that goes back every, every year he exceeds expectations. Right. Which is. So what, what if we get to the point where Ohio state has a top five recruiting class every year? Because we, right. you know, Ohio State has the resources, right? I mean, yep. it's not like, yeah. and Ohio State has been. I mean, Mike Conley was the f- number four player in the cl- in his class, and Greg Oden was the second or whatever. And right, so it's it, it's not Ohio State getting elite level recruits is not a an unprecedented thing. Oh no! So if we get right. back to the point where he's consistently has top ten recruiting classes, what is what is he able to do with those? Because that's also something we haven't gotten to see Holtman do is have a year where his recruiting class and what he has coming back is so good that he's a preseason top seven team, right? We've seen him do it with talent that wasn't pegged as top 10 caliber talent. But as we've talked about with, with other coaches who, whether it be um, Mike White down at Florida or somebody else who, you know, having to do that in a season where the expectations are so high. Of course, we haven't seen Holtman do that yet, but he continues to put his teams in positions that we never thought we were going to be putting them in. And uh, that's a testament to him. And every time, right, every season, I think he moves up that list a little bit um, in terms of the elite, elite coaches in in college basketball. Um, I'll piggyback real quick off of that because my next takeaway is that I'm not, I'm not nearly as confident in Villanova's main guys as I'd like to be. Mm-hmm. Listen, Creighton's going to have games where you're just not going to beat them, right? When they're going to shoot as well as they did, they're going to put up 86 points, and you're going to have to do something impressive to to beat them. Jermaine Samuels and Justin Moore combined for 37 points on Saturday, and you still got blown out because – Colin Gillespie and Jeremiah Robinson are all combined for 16 points on six of 25 shooting. I, and, and this isn't the first time that we've seen them sort of at least one of them disappear in big games, close games, big games, whatever you want to, whatever you want to put there. If Jermaine Samuels scores 16 points, you should never lose. You should never lose that game because he's just you can't depend on just Jermaine Samuels to get 16 and then you add the fact that Justin Moore put up 21 and you still lose by 16 it, it's a it's a weird phenomenon to not be completely confident in the best players on Villanova's team because over the last 5 years it's been Josh Hart it's been Jalen Brunson it's been Right, Omari Spellman. It's it, I've just never, if if nothing else, I can I've been able to count on Josh Hart to be great in big games, or count on Jalen Brunson to be great in big games. And sometimes these other, and sometimes this year, um, 
Gillespie and Jeremiah Robinson Earl haven't been anywhere near as good as I'd like them to be in games against good teams. And Saturday was another example of that. And, um, and it is part of the reason why, to your point, Josh, that they're not one of the four best teams in the country um, because there's some unreliability, unreliability there at times um, that I wish wish wasn't there. But I definitely wasn't expecting that to happen in Omaha over the weekend. Um, and what ha- Gillespie and Robinson Earl, their, their performances were, were part of why that happened. Yeah, absolutely, and and that um, that sort of that sort of leads into the reverse of that that I have not the reverse, but the other side of that that I have is my second point, which is, um, which is about Creighton, and you know the more I think about this point, the more I'm actually the more I'm trying to make sure I don't overreact, because like you said, Josh, there are games where Creighton is going to look like this, and that's not really ever been the the concern about Creighton is their ability to have games of uh, you know to have these elite games it's just sort of like can they be consistent is their formula going to work consistently and so there's a part of me though that feels like this what we saw last night or no that what when was that game yesterday afternoon saturday Saturday. Uh, over the week saturday over the weekend was a different new and invert a new and improved looking creighton team there's a part of me that thinks that there's also a part of me that think that that's my sort of my bigger takeaway is it looked like an, an improved version of creighton um right Marcus Zagorowski with a statement game he's just dealt with these injuries and it now it looks like he is fully healthy and if, if he is really that kind of version of himself you know with some level of consistency they just haven't had that because he hasn't he's dealt with a couple injuries this year already so they just haven't had him sort of as someone that they knew he, you know could deliver in the same way game after game if that's the level that he's going to be coming at um, more games than not then that that obviously that you know can help increase the upside of them i don't know if it it doesn't really address and that's part of where i'm sort of almost wavering on my own point the more i think about it is i don't it doesn't really give us the answer to some of what we were con- might be might have been concerned about great right like this is important like it does remind us of the upside that this team has if things click right in the right circumstances and they show up in the right way and and things all happen and match up the right way it's sort of a reminder of the upside that they have but i guess it doesn't really answer some of the bigger questions we have about Creighton can you do it consistently is your formula not going to fall apart against certain teams and certain matchups you know is there that consistency so it has me kind of wavering into this is this a new version of Creighton or is this just a reminder of their ceiling and we don't know so I'm curious about what you guys think yeah that was that was my third point too I I, I'm framing it as Creighton finally showed up Mm -hmm. but waiting for that game all season and by and large we just haven't gotten there. Now, right, right. yes, part of that is the fact that zigorowski has been banged up and missed a couple of games. Part of it is that I still also think that Zigorowski has not been comfortable having to be the guy. It was Kamar Baldwin ex- two years ago of being right. trying to figure out how to do everything and also be at the top of everybody's scouting report. Right. That it's a very different world when you have Tyshawn Alexander there to go get you 19 every game or 18 or 16 or whatever you average Mm -hmm. and also be the best defensive player on your team. Right. So it's a combination of, yeah, I'm sure that the fact that he hasn't been a hundred percent doesn't help anything, but I think there's a mental part of it too. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not going to say because he looked great for one game and a game that Creighton historically has won. They've been phenomenal against top five teams for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. They just always seem to win those games. Mm Mm-hmm. In, the, in this run where they've become this top 25, top 15 program in the country these past handful of seasons. I need to see more and I need to see it consistently for me to feel like this is anything different than... Uh, I, I expected to see this more from them and still not be convinced that they're a legitimate Final Four contender because of the questions that we always have. Mm-hmm. So the fact that it took them this long to have this kind of game, yeah, I'm it was an impressive performance. It just doesn't mean all that much for me going forward because right, we see Creighton. This is, this is Creighton. You're going to get some of these. You're going to get some clunkers. And ultimately, they haven't proven it works when it matters most in March. Now, yes, last year was the best team and they didn't get an opportunity. That needs to be taken into the, the equation too. But I, it was awfully impressive. 
Mm-hmm. I it doesn't change how I feel about this team. Someone tweeted at me after you know four minutes left, Creighton's up by twenty five or whatever it was, and I tweeted, "Well, things are happening in Omaha that I didn't did not see coming." And someone responded with, "Cue the Creighton can make a Final Four run noise for the next week." No. The reality of the situation, no, you know, ironically, the reality of the situation is that Creighton can make a Final Four run sure. if you catch them on the right two weeks. Right. It's the it's just the same conversation that we had with Creighton last year. If you get the version of Creighton that you got last week on Saturday, they can absolutely go to the Final Four. It's stupid to say that they can't. They put up 86 right. points on Villanova because of the way they shot the ball. If they shoot the ball well, they can absolutely beat anybody in the country. They can. They have that kind of firepower. When you have shooters like Zagorowski and Mitch Ballack and the guys around them, whether it's Denzel Mahoney or Damian or or uh, Bishop or whoever it is, Christian Bishop, they absolutely have the talent to go to the Final Four. Absolutely. But to your point, Josh, that's not the version of Creighton that we've gotten all year. The Creighton we saw on Saturday, sure, they could win four straight games and go to the Final Four, sure, but they probably won't. We probably won't get that version of Creighton for four straight games, and that's why you'll never bet. That's why typically we're not betting on Creighton to get to the Final Four, and that we won't this year because when they don't do that, Chris, to to the point you like to harp on is they they don't win in multiple ways there against no good teams, beat. right? Exactly. They shoot the ball well, yeah. they beat good teams. They don't shoot the ball well. They don't beat good teams, right? And mm-hmm. and it's it's really that cut that cut and dry. But um, if you get the version of Creighton you got on Saturday, then sure they could win four games in the tournament. Absolutely, I have mm-hmm. almost no doubt that they could do it. Um, but the odds of you getting four straight games of that Creighton team, or I guess you know three straight games if they're a five seed, right? And you. Right you get through the 12 seed and the, but you then you have to beat the four the one and the two <laughs> then you need that version of Creighton for all three games to to make it through that stretch of teams hypothetically speaking but um my last takeaway I want to talk about another team that scored a bunch of points and reminded us that when they play a certain way that they're really terrifying Alabama scored 115 points in a regulation game this weekend that's ridiculous 64 points, 51 points, and they also have the number two defense in the country at Kempom, talking from an efficiency standpoint. I think, right, Alabama had their their 10 days or 10 games of really being impressive, and then everybody came back down to earth on them to a certain extent because they're a good team, not a great team, and when they don't shoot it extremely well, they're going to at least be in a dogfight with, with other good teams. But there might not be a team in the country right now that I'm more terrified of them having a really good shooting night and just not being able to keep up with them other than Gonzaga, right? If, if Gonzaga shoots it well, you're not going to beat them. Alabama, with the defense that Alabama has, if they shoot the ball well, they, right, it's, it's pretty close to 0 to 100 real quick, right? They either have mm-hmm. a 65, 63 tight game kind of stuff or they score 115 <laughs> points and win by 30. Right. right. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, 95 points and win by 25. There's not really a whole lot of in-between there. So my point being is that, right, if they can get through the the one game in the tournament, you know, early in the tournament, in the first weekend, if they, you know, one of their two games they play that they can get through their rough shooting night because everybody has a rough shooting night in the tournament. It's just the teams that find ways to win that game that mm-hmm. keep going and go deep. That We could t- be talking about Alabama playing deep into the second weekend if you get them right again on the right, on the right night. And I know it was Georgia, but also <laughs> nobody scores 115 points in college basketball games. They just don't like like we don't do yeah. that. This is not not, not in a power five, not in a, a high major power five, big six, whatever you want to call it, conference. Right. right. I mean, and has Gonzaga scored 115 this year? No, you're probably right. I don't think so. And, and, and I'll look right, right. They have a bunch of amount of points that you're right. So you got 102. They scored 116 against Portland. There you go. But the, you know they scored 100 against San Francisco on Saturday. 
Right. Gonzaga has a ton of they have an alarming amount of 90 point games. Right. Yeah. And I'm not saying that there's a that Alabama terrifies me more than Gonzaga, but on the right shooting night. And especially when you pair it with a defense that is really, really quality down there in Tuscaloosa, that's the type of team that if they they get through that that sort of grinded out game and they have a defense that's equipped to do that, um, mm-hmm. that that's the type of team that can win a couple games in a row in the tournament really quick. And you're talking about Alabama playing in a Sweet 16, you know, in in, in at least a Sweet 16, and not if not an Elite Eight, and having a chance to to go to the Final Four. And I was just reminded of that this weekend with Bama because we kind of, right, everyone kind of cooled off, whether it's because it just became old news or they had some games where, okay, yeah, against good teams, they're, they they aren't nearly as effective all the time, um, right? You have, they lose to Oklahoma, they lose to Missouri. Those are two quality basketball teams that they lost, you know, two games in a row to, right? Um mm-hmm. And things sort of cool off, but uh, a nice reminder of just how explosive that offense can be on on the right night. They've got a really high ceiling. The yeah. the question is sort of the same as Creighton's, but they're better, much better defensively. Is can you right? Can you kind of survive the bad games? Can you look like that team more often than not, or are you going to have to go fight your way through a bunch of sixty five, sixty three games? to hope that you catch a good night in the elite eight or something, or the sweet mm-hmm. 16. Mm-hmm. It, there's the, and especially against good teams, they haven't always proven that they're capable of looking that good. So what happens when the opposition gets better and they can take away some of that stuff and they don't make life easy for you. Right. But, for Oh sure. yeah, absolutely. I still think they're a top 10 team in the country and the ceiling is incredibly high. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Are we out of takeaways? Chris, do you have one more? Uh, I have a very brief one here. Uh, it's, it is a short one. I think the Pac-12 title race looks like it could be very interesting. Uh, it's a Oregon with a slim victory over Arizona over the weekend, the Ducks' third straight win, and that keeps them in the race for the Pac-12 title along with uh, USC, UCLA, Colorado. Um, it's an Oregon team um, that is seems to be hitting its stride with its players you know, right down the stretch here. Last year in that conference, it was UCLA that finished on a tear to make the title race in the uh, in the Pac-12 interesting. I think that could be Oregon this year. Um, they've got a game coming up this week against Colorado. So those are the third and fourth place teams in that conference. So that's going to be interesting. Um, no bigger takeaway than that. It's just, I think this is going to be a, a conference to actually watch how things really play out down the stretch because it has the potential that it could get really interesting. They just haven't gotten to play enough games. I feel right. bad for them. They're sitting there on the bubble. They're not yeah. a bubble team. They just haven't gotten to play, and you have a couple bad breaks, and yeah. Yeah. I'm right there with you. Very high on Oregon's potential as we go forward here. And, you know, it's funny. For as much flack as the Pac-12 has gotten, rightfully so, they have some of the worst teams in the Power Five, uh, among the Power Five schools. Mm-hmm. They got two teams in, in the top 14 at Kempom. Right. USC is the 10th-ranked defense in the country with a really, really – talented freshman on that team of course and then Colorado I think has been one of the pleasant surprises of the Pac-12 this year but it's not just they're not just 16 and 6 because they play in the Pac-12 mm-hmm. they've got you know the metrics like them and there are some teams right to your point Josh Oregon is a bubble team that is better than a bubble team because of the nature of the season and then you add some teams in there that I think have been better than they were supposed to be. UCLA is ten and three in conference, taking care of business in in conference like they did last year, uh, doing that again. And USC being eleven and two in conference isn't something I did not see coming. And to have four teams at the top of that conference that, at the very least, intrigue me is not something I was expecting to be able to say at the beginning of this year. Um, and so hopefully, right, we can not only see those teams continue to play well but uh, maybe feel like the Pac-12 will have some sort of impact on the bigger on the bigger picture of of college basketball this season but they've got some teams at the top of that conference that are intriguing um, and the metrics the metrics like a few of them coming up next we'll talk uh, landing spots destinations for uh, JJ Watt and Carson Wentz we'll do that next you're watching 110 Daily on the 110 Sports Network